Hey there, my name is Ruth Greenwood and I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you today. I am Vegan Teacher UK. I have a presence on social media now and I'm actually a qualified primary teacher turned vegan around four years ago. And I'm so interested in the, the questions we have coming through today. But first of all, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. So I am a teacher and um, I think it's important to spread the message to young children who I've met in real life. And <laughs> this is my cue for my book. <laughs> Basically, lots of children were reaching out to me for support and advice because they wanted to be vegan. They weren't sure how to be vegan and they, they encountered a lot of problems in their life. So I wrote this little book as a collection of stories, really, all rolled into one kind of fictitious story about a young girl who decides to go vegan and just stop eating animals. And it's called, I don't want to eat animals anymore. I don't make any profits from this book, so I'm, I'm not shamelessly plugging it. I'm just letting you know about it. It is available on Amazon and you can see all my links down below and you can get it as a free ebook. And it's just there to support the younger generation really. And um, I also have a collection of notebooks that they can carry around. It's for the kids really. Honestly, us adults can reach out to each other and support each other during the process, but the kids, they don't really have anyone else. And little things like this, they can carry it around with them. They can put big vegan plans in here or recipes or whatever they want to. And I don't make any profit from these either. It all goes back into getting my book into primary schools to make them more vegan inclusive because believe it or not, schools really aren't vegan inclusive at all and a lot of vegan kids are getting bullied really badly for it so that's what drives me but in the meantime i've actually got quite a huge following on this um crazy little app called tiktok i've got around thirty thousand followers on there and a lot of the kids ask me but well, what do we do how can we grow vegetables and how can we do all this if we don't use animals so i was really delighted to be asked on this show today and um and the questions are coming soon but first of all we've got some amazing news we're super excited to to announce that our vegan organic festival 2021 is going ahead the festival will be at Chayan cultural center an 11 acre site deep in the cornish countryside with a capacity of around 200 people camping facilities on site hostel and nearby alternative accommodation Cheyenne is an off-grid veganic apple farm, oh lovely, with its own supply of natural spring water. The event's going to be from the 12th to the 16th of August this year. So for more information, visit the, veganic, the Vegan Organic Network website, that's fun. And um, yeah, how exciting is that? It's, um, hopefully the weather's going to be good for that one. And um, so yeah, we've had a bunch of questions. This this happens often and there's a bunch of questions coming in from people. So let's meet our panel because this is all new to me and I'm not equipped to answer these questions. We've got some great people on today and they're gonna help answer the questions. So first up, let's meet our first panel mem member. This is Aranya. So Aranya is a permaculture teacher and author of Permaculture Design, a step-by-step -step guide. He launched an online course this summer based on the design process described in the book. Currently, he's finishing a second book about the application of systems, thinking and patterns in permaculture design due to be published this year. He's been gardening for 35 years and is especially interested in low input systems like forest gardening and no dick. So that's great. So we have Aranya here now. Hi, Aranya. How are you doing there? Hi, Ruth. I'm good. Great to see you. So um, could you tell us a little bit about um, if you've got any up and coming courses or projects on the go or what led you to this path? Why, why are you here doing what you're doing? Um, well, I suppose becoming vegan and, and starting gardening sort of happened about the same time. <laughs> it seems so long ago. And then I discovered permaculture and um, Permaculture and vegan doesn't always go together, but for me, it's also, it makes a lot of sense. So yeah, I just love being outside, being with nature, gardening, learning all the time from other people from nature and so on. So yeah. 
Absolutely. There's always something new to learn, isn't there? And that's why I'm so delighted to be here today. Um, yeah. It's um, exciting. So that's great. Thank you. So next we have um, Peter um, is going to, we, if we can introduce Peter. Here we go. Thank you. Peter Obrecht lives in Sweden with his family where they operate a micro farm growing veggies for seed for a seed firm called Nordfro. Together with his family, he grows a large variety of vegetables and beans. They have a large forest garden with perennial vegetables, including fruit and berries. They teach forest garden design and host people studying agriculture, small scale farming and permaculture. They mainly use no dig methods. Awesome. Welcome, Peter. How are you Hi, doing? Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm doing fine. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's great to have you here, too. Um, so maybe you could tell us as well about what, what led you to be here and why you do what you do, what drives you. So I turned vegan first and then uh, I turned into doing a lot of animal rights stuff. And uh, one thing led to another uh, when talking about animal rights, I uh, came across a lot of people claiming it wasn't impossible, was it not possible to grow organic vegan style in Sweden, especially in Sweden, because it's a colder climate and it wouldn't be possible to grow, you know, protein and so on. So uh, I had the opportunity to get this small farm uh, and um, so I went to try it out and now I'm stuck uh, stuck here and I'm enjoying it and been growing vegan for about 10 years. That's brilliant. And anything new up and coming uh, courses, projects or just everything's just always happening all the time? So we all got clear clearance almost today. It's almost confirmed that uh, we are about to find a firm that can uh, 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 put the uh, biocyclic vegan seal on uh, growers and produce. So it's that's really nice. So that's the newest from vegan organic farming in Sweden. That's really exciting news. Thank you so much, Peter. So now let's introduce um, John. Do we have John here? Great. This is John Dale. And John forages for edible wild foods in the natural habitat where he lives in Cornwall. He runs a veganic project called Willow Way near Newquay, a place of healing, education, teaching and self-sufficiency. He wants to help people reduce their eco footprint and become engaged with where their food comes from and how it's grown. Hi, John, how yeah. are you doing? Hi, Ruth, yes, fine, thank you. Absolutely fantastic. So yeah. maybe you could let us know a little bit about why you're here today and, and how you started on your journey as well. That would be great. Okay, so yeah, uh, similar to Peter, um, I, I, I was vegetarian for quite a long time and then went vegan a long time ago and um, basically figuring out that um, the nutritional side of things and realizing that organic um, was higher in nutrition and no uh, herbicides and pesticides and it just totally made sense there and then about eight years ago I met Dan and uh, and uh, connected with the vegan organic network and that just really resonated because obviously um, I didn't realize that uh, regular organic uh, fruit and vegetables is still um, able to be uh, using animal byproducts. And that sort of, as a vegan, it didn't really sit too well with me. So to find out about the Vegan Organic Network and to learn about how to grow uh, nutritious food uh, veganically, uh, it's been quite a journey in the last eight years and yeah so that's i started growing just really small st uh, scale on a windowsill then went up to half an allotment then a lot a full allotment and now we, as um as you mentioned I'm, I'm, i've got four acres uh, in cornwall and yeah it's exciting times and also the same sort of reasons as why i got into foraging as well um, and that was because basically I was realizing that uh, these wild foods that are growing locally and seasonally, um, wild and free, were actually more nutritious than what we can buy in the supermarkets. So it's like, this is a no-brainer here. So I basically started teaching myself about uh, foraging and wild foods. And one thing led to the next. And now, um, yeah, quite a lot of experience down the line. 
So, yeah. That's super now, interesting. Yeah, because, I'm able to yeah. share that with people. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, I'm just thinking it's super interesting because at schools we're taught, and as children we're taught, never pick anything up off the street, don't pick up anything off the ground and, and eat it. And it goes against <laughs> everything that we've been taught yeah. since we've been so. That's very true, yeah. Yeah, I find it it's super interesting. <laughs> I think it's one of the next kind of stages in veganism, veganism isn't it? It's not something I've been a couple of years in. So. It's a no-brainer, really, yeah. It is once you think about it. It's not until it actually hits you that the food you are growing, that you are eating, is grown on things grown with animal manure and all the other things that are that are um, associated with it as well. So, so yeah. I'm, I'm definitely going to learn a lot today. So thank you Good. for being here with us today, John. Anything else? Thanks, we move on to uh, no, just you can move along and then look for, looking forward to the questions. Yay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So next up, we have Graham Burnett. And Graham has been an activist for social and environmental justice since leaving school in the late 70s. Graham has taught permaculture workshops and courses for over 20 years. He founded Spiral Seed in 2001 and is a regular contributor to publications as diverse as Positive News, The Sunday Times and Permaculture Magazine. He is the author of The Vegan Book of Permaculture and Permaculture of Earth's Beginner's Guide and is currently writing the regenerative allotment and garden. So there's a lot going on there for Graham. And here he is. Great to have you here, Graham. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, thanks, Ruth. Um, just to let everyone know, I'm, I'm experiencing a little bit of delay at my end. There's like about a five, ten seconds, so things aren't kind of quite synchronising. So hopefully that'll be kind of okay. But yeah, I'm, I'm good. Um, a little bit like um, Aranya, I've been uh, down the allotment today, planting onions and got some trees to plant tomorrow at a community garden. So it's all busy at the moment. That's absolutely awesome. Don't worry about the lag. We'll go with it. We can hear you clearly anyway. So that's the main thing. It's great to be around you all okay. today. I'm feeling like such that's a newbie. I've only been vegan for four, over four years now. Um, and I thought that was quite a while, but I wish I'd have made the switch sooner like um, like you all did. Is there anything you want to tell us about? Um, anything you're working on? Um, yeah, uh, similar to Aranya, I've got a... Um, vegan um, culture design course that beginning in um, three weeks time I think it's um, I'm looking at my thing in 17th of April that starts um, still have a couple of places left on that um, it's been quite interesting adapting to the um, online format wasn't sure if it was going to work obviously but here we are but actually it's worked really well and um, this will be the third online vegan permaculture design course that um, I've been kind of running and also going to be running a forest garden course that um, a four-week forest gardening course online uh, kind of aimed at a more urban you know kind of city and town dwellers well, it was smaller gardens um, maybe school gardens um, community gardens allotments those sort of um, places um, so a couple of courses, and there's a few other courses in the in the pipeline, and um, yeah, various publications that are kind of working on. Just produced a little book of um, a little manual called "A Garden in Your Kitchen," which tells you how to kind of do sprouting in your own kitchen and make ferments, you know, kind of sauerkraut and kimchi and stuff like that. So that was literally back from the printers about two days ago. So um, I'm posting those out to people. So that's that's uh, yeah, that's what I've been up to. That's absolutely great to hear. Thank you, Graham. Because there tends to be this misconception, doesn't there, that um, that veganism is um, too expensive and it's not achievable for everybody. So it's brilliant that you're bringing uh, how to grow to um, city kitchens as well. So thank you for that. So we have everybody here, um, and it's been great to it's been really great to meet you all. We've got some questions now, and um, let's have a look and see our first question. Oh, there it is. Okay, that's great. So, um, this one's about dandelions. And somebody's asked, do dandelions have seasonal biorhythms? I tried growing seeds from cold feet to wild dandelion specimens indoors during the winter, under conditions in which they would have gone reasonably well outdoors during any other season of the year. 
My motivation is to investigate dandelions as a potential year-round source of salad greens. Dandelions are notorious for being able to thrive in the most non-freezing conditions, yet all I've managed to get were spindly sprouts that did not survive for very long. Best regards. Uh, thank you, Mark Long, for bringing that question in. And who would like to have a go answering that? I think, okay. if John, does John do that? Um, yeah, yeah. John, are you able to speak to us about dandelions? Well, um, I haven't really got any experience uh, growing uh, dandelions from seed at home to, uh, or in a greenhouse, to be honest. But um, what I would say is that uh, dandel dandelions are obviously a great source of uh, vitamins, minerals and nutrition. And... What I would say is, um, as a forager, what I do, when I find them, when I find a healthy uh, dandelion and I har basically I, I harvest and preserve by dehydrating the leaves and if I need to dig it out, um, like if it's in the wrong sort of place and I'll um, wash and dry the, dry the roots and then grind them and the same with the, the leaves. Um, so basically, I will, yeah, preserve the dandelion um, in its dried form, and then that can be encapsulated. So that's that's what I would do, really. Um, but yeah, they are a very strong plant, and they're pretty vigorous in most places all year round. But I'd say spring would be the best time to harvest them when the when the roots uh, the leaves are kind of young. Um, as far as growing them indoors, another pro thing that might have been a problem is that they're taproot. So maybe trying to sprout them as a taproot might be one of the reasons why they're not working too well indoors. It's like if you think about it, you wouldn't really grow a carrot or a parsnip inside. Uh, it would be fairly tricky, I think. Um, so, yeah, and also the flowers can be harvested and um, vegan honey uh, alternative can be made from the flowers so yeah i think it's more about the preserving of them when they're in season and then using them like through the winter or for the rest of the year when uh, when you feel like you need that extra nutrition that's awesome john thank you i think um that's another one of those things isn't it um as kids again we're taught that we shouldn't pick these plants and I've, i'm sure i remember a grown-up telling me if you eat dandelions you wet the bed <laughs> So, um, did you want to add something there, Aranya? Uh, yes, well, the only thing I can think of that might be a problem is that dandelions like to colonise compacted ground. You find them where you get uh, compaction from treading on, you know, lawns are a classic place. People walk on lawns, they lie on lawns, they mow them, and you get dandelions. So, perhaps you might just be growing them in too light and fluffy a medium. Maybe you need a a bit of a compacted clay soil or something and give it a good whack and see if that makes a difference. That's a really great suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah it's interesting, actually. Again, I'm showing here what a novice I am. I only really learned about dandelions last year um, when somebody suggested making honey from the dandelions in the garden. <laughs> and um, it's really opened my eyes up. So I've got some facts here. Um, dandelions are actually not weeds, which we are taught and they are not. They are from the same family as sunflowers. Um, a dandelion seed can travel up to five miles before it lands. And one cup of dandelion greens is 535% of your daily recommended vitamin K and 112% of your vitamin A intake. Um, every part of the dandelion is edible. And up until the 1800s, um, this pleases me no end. Dandelions were seen as extremely beneficial and they would remove grass to plant dandelions. So all of these people mowing their lawns every week, I think it's about time we got rid of those lawn numbers. <laughs> let the dandelions take over. I'm sure the honeybees would be happy anyway. <laughs> so does anybody want to add anything there or should we move to question two? Okay, let's let's move our beautiful friend the dandelion behind and go to question two. Um, whom would you recommend as veganic organic seed suppliers, please? <laughs> Thank you from Chris. Okay, so who would like to answer this? 
I can contribute. Thank so, you. Yeah, I mean, essentially, I don't think there is such a thing as sort of vegan organic seed yet. So this is part of the problem is that unless, of course, you're growing it for yourself and you're doing veganic gardening and you're saving your own seeds. So that would be the best. But obviously, you have to start with something. And also, seed saving has some complexities that need learning. Um, but it's also fun. So, yes, I think really, I mean, uh, Peter, it sounds like Peter's growing some seeds. So maybe Peter is can supply some seed. And there's also um, somebody called Pippa who runs Beans and Herbs, who grows uh, beans, particularly be beans and pulses and things, which you can buy from her, which will be vegan sort of certified, bond certified. But a lot of, yeah, a lot of seed suppliers are organic or biodynamic. So I, I tend to go with that because there is, that's the best choice there is mostly these days. Though I certainly have some, uh, some good recommendations. Uh, real seeds, so real R-E-A-L, real seeds in Wales. They're lovely people they've been doing. Is They're just, yeah, lovely seed people. Um, Vital Seeds is also a nice small company in Devon. Tamar Organics is another one from, uh, well, kind of Cornwall, Devon on the border. And they're very good. And Seed Cooperative of what, as well, which I also, they, because of course with seeds, you want the seed to be good as well. And I found Seed Cooperative seeds very good. I'm only waving this because most companies now don't have a paper catalog anymore. <laughs> you just have to order online. Um, and of course, there's the obvious, this one, you can buy a few kind of vegan composty things in here. But um, yeah, I'm afraid seed is organic is as good as it gets, but hopefully that will change. So I think that's the thing with being vegan, isn't it? It's um, um, it's about doing our best all the time, isn't it? And just trying to do the very best with what we've got. And that's another myth that's often thought about that if it's not perfect, then, then we can't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. But we, we can work towards this goal and strive towards it, can't we? So if anybody watching wants to drop any of those links in the comments below, it would be lovely if people interacted with the comments. If they know a supplier or for, for organic seeds, they can um organic seeds, they can drop that down there and it'll give us something to go and look up. So somebody wanted to add something there before I started prattling on, sorry. <laughs> I saw did I see a hand moving? Does anybody want to join in to add Brian, to that? Yeah. that thank Brian. you. Thank you. So we we grow seeds for seed company, the Swedish seed company uh which are veganic seeds and hopefully we will be certified in maybe one or two years by the bicyclic vegan standard and uh, that's what we're working towards and hopefully we also can expand and bring in more seeds so uh, up to day we uh, uh, grow seeds for about 10 vegetables and uh, they're also uh, sold at nordfrö but they have not, uh, they have not like uh, marked up as a vegan organic seed. But if you buy them as from Peters, my name is on them. So it's a small seed company uh, where they tell you uh, which each grower is. So and where they are grown and in which methods. Wow, that's amazing. So, uh, so we're also hoping for a bigger, more seed grow organic seed growers. Definitely. The demand is just going to keep increasing, isn't it? So we need more people like you doing that. Thank you. And Graham? The Graham is muted. Um, if we can just... Um, can we, there we go. Thank you. We're back on, Graham. Um, yeah, in addition to uh, all the wonderful companies, um, Aranya has mentioned and what Peter's uh, talked about as well, um, a little heads up for um, Incredible Vegetables, um, who um, specialise in perennial vegetables, um, things like perennial kales, um, perennial onions, um, perennial um, climbing spinach, things like that. Um, I can't think of their website offhand, but from our Incredible Vegetables, run by a, a wonderful woman called uh, Maggie Barber. So, um, yeah, have a look. Have a look at them. Thank you. If anyone does have a link for that, anybody watching might have a link for that, please drop it in the comments. And while you're there, please uh, like the video and subscribe to this awesome um, channel because um, there's more great stuff coming your way. Uh, so that was question two. We're on two. We've got another question here. Um, question three. 
Um, the north side of my garden won't grow any veggies well. This includes potatoes, beans, peas, carrots, lettuce, beets, and parsnips. My soil tends to be higher clay, but I've been adding a uh, compost material to it for the last two years to try and help increase the amount of nutrients and lessen compaction. There's a defined line from where my garden does well to where it does poorly. This portion of the garden does get about six or seven hours of sun each day, but it's about 15 feet from the forest. Thank you, Pete, for bringing that question to us in Dorset. And who would like to have a go at helping Pete with this question? Again, I could <laughs> contribute something. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so he, he starts saying what kind of forest, but I know Dorset fairly well. So it may be a sort of heathy forest with pine. That may not be the case. So there may be a pH issue with you know, pine needles coming down, or there might be um, other trees that have quite extensive feeder roots close to the surface, like ash and poplar, which also will feed some distance away. Um, you always got a bit of a sort of pros and cons with being next to the forest because in the forest, you should have a, a nice mycorrhizal network if it's a healthy landscape, um, and that will venture out into your garden. If you can plug your plants into that, then they will benefit. But it sounds like that probably what he needs to be doing that close to the forest is to be growing some sort of forest edge plants like shrubs and you know your raspberries and your strawberries and things that would grow naturally at the woodland edge and inhabit that realm and be familiar with um, that kind of soil because also what trees do is they change the soil from back we often grow vegetables in a bacterial soil um, so all the things he's talking about there like to grow in bacterial soils because they're early on in su the successional process, whereas trees turn soil fun much more fungal and that provides a different kind of nitrogen, which isn't necessarily what annuals and perennials, uh, your biennials like. So it might be a, an acidity thing. It might just be competition with roots. It might just be that the soil's not quite right, obviously. He's no doubt he's watering plants, but maybe the trees are drinking the water or maybe it's a nutrient thing. Um, I think I would look at what does grow well there, even the weeds and say, OK, so what plant families are these? What kind of things are growing well here? Do we have any plants that we humans grow and cultivate for food that would be in the same family and go from there? Um, yeah. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything they want to add to that? Any snippets of wisdom? <laughs> that's, that's great, Aranya. Thank you for that. That was really detailed. Okay, question four. Um, what makes a permaculture garden? And this is from Doris from Kent. Thank you. I have a joke. <laughs> Permaculturist. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was that? A permaculturist makes a permaculture garden. And it's a joke. Anyway, I think this might be one for Graham. No, you're absolutely right. <laughs> okay, Graham. Um, Thanks, Aranya. We can we can we can probably do a do a two hander on this one. I'm sure. Um, yeah. Um, I think really a permaculture. I mean, it's about kind of systems thinking. Really, it's about how things kind of connect up and work together there might be a number of things that kind of associated when one year of permaculture the herbs fire or it had um deep beds had a culture kind of thing going on there which is kind of basically growing on kind of cave wood and stuff like that um but all of those really they're kind of they're not really what kind of um, Oh yeah, this is my garden. You know, I'll go around someone's place and they'll say, "Oh, this is my garden, and I grow kind of organically here, or I grow vegetables here." And this is a little corner in there. But actually, um, the permaculture isn't necessarily something that's visible. It's um, an overall systems, a system approach, how we kind of connect up those different elements within that system of the system that is a garden. So in fact, a, a permaculture garden, air quotes, might just look like a very kind of conventional garden or a garden that on the surface you might think, well, this is a permaculture garden because it's got 
curve the no big beds but if they're not actually kind of connected and there's no actual kind of placement decisions there then that's not really what i'd say a permaculture garden is so really it's about it's about design and it's about systems thinking and how we put those together um yeah i don't know if there's anything around you might want to add to that or anybody else that's in the in the room well, I think you've summed that up pretty well. <laughs> Just, yes, I mean, it's what you're saying about when people look at something and say, where is the permaculture? And often people will pick on something that's unfamiliar, like a compost toilet or a hugel bed and say, oh, that must be what makes it permaculture. But actually the permaculture is the connectivity, the thing that you don't see generally under the surface. So to see permaculture, you have to spend time there and understand the relationships between things. So. The designer sees the permaculture, whereas the visitor doesn't so much. You have to look a lot harder. You have to understand what to look for. So, uh, but yeah, Thank lots you. of happy things generally is what you see in a permaculture garden, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. And am I right in thinking that sometimes this involves some rotation as well, that some plants deplete um, um, nutrients from soil and, you, and it, it's, it's some of it about rotation. So that would involve taking a lot longer and watching the garden over a few years, five, 10 years maybe. Or is that, am I thinking about could, something else? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it could be. We have a question on that later, don't we, on rotation. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Okay, we we'll just go with that. Yeah. But we have, a, we do actually have a, a short video now. Oh, sorry, before the short video, yeah. John, what do you want to add there? Sorry. I just wanted to add um, something that Aranya taught me when I, when I asked him for some advice on my place and was just fantastic advice really. And it is uh, one of the principles of uh, permaculture is to keep an eye and watch, the, watch what grows through the different seasons before you actually start tackling and making too many plans. Because there's so many different things under the ground that are dormant, uh, that sort of come alive during the different seasons that you, you can just start, if you, if you don't leave it that full year, um, you can start destroying things that are actually beneficial, that are actually already there. And I just think that's just, that sums a lot up really. Uh, mm -hmm. And from there you can actually work with what, you can actually learn a lot. The property, each unique place will teach you a lot about what's gonna survive there and what's gonna thrive. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I think that sums it up a lot really, because you're working with nature. So yeah, <laughs> okay. Thank you, Peter. I mean, for me, it's uh, a lot about observation. Observation, what's uh, what's in brackets na natural, and I think it's a it's a cause for veg veganic permaculture. So where I live, if I watch um, my ecosystem here outside my house, there's no like big grazing animals like sheep or cows or or even you know uh, ducks or so on, uh, keeping f f things. The ecosystem working it's more natural non-domesticated animals doing all the important stuff that which is needed so i always think of permaculture in that way you can also like uh, show how, how really like organic thinking and permaculture goes hand in hand by just showing people how you can observe nature and, and and you know see how that works and where there's no domestication actually taking place you know mm, true yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, now uh, we have a short video from Shumei. Um, if you can hey, Hello everyone. Minasan, konnichiwa. O genki desu ka? Eh, daibu ne, 3月 inatte, attakaku natte kimashita. Ima, 3月 no chujun desu ke domo, attake no yosu o desu ne, omise sashi te itadakimasu. Ma, omo ni ne, ima tane maki o don 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 sashi te itadaite, nai ga ne, don 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 dekite ru jyotai desu. Sore dewa. いきましょう。はい、これはですね。レタスです。レタスを3種類ぐらい植えております。今発芽してね、どんどん大きくなってきてますね。え、これは2月の中旬に種まきをしております。これはリークですね。このリークはね、え、2月1日に種まきをしましたね。ちょっとずつ大きくなってきておりますね。
続きまして、これね、リークに似てますけどね、これはスプリングオニオンですね。スプリングオニオンもね、芽が出てきました。ちょっとね、種まき遅いかもですけども、えー、多分できると思います。これはイチゴの苗ですね。これも定食していかないといけないですね。はい、これはバラですね。えー、以前動画で紹介させていただきましたこれは水菜ですだいぶ大きくなってきましたのでそろそろこれも定食していこうと思っておりますはいこれわかるかなこれ<笑>ラベンダーですね種からラベンダーを作っておりますちょっとまだひょろひょろですけどあったかく Okay, so yeah,、um, the Shimai Natural Agriculture Online Learning Course will be on the 4th of April.、Um, you can visit the Vegan Organic Network website for more information about that and, of course, about anything else we've talked about today. So that brings us to our next question. And、um, question five I've often read and been told that with foraging, less is often more. Whilst you may need X kilograms of a berry or flowers like elderflowers, you should never pick a bush clean. How can you estimate when to move on to the next bush or not pick at all? Would it be like leave at least half? What's the reason to leave an amount on the bush? And this is from Robert. Thanks for your question, Robert. Who'd like to try and, and help Robert with this question about berry picking? So, yeah, I will. And、um, yeah, it's a very good question actually, very well thought out.、Um, what I tend to, the rule I tend to stick to is forage 10% of、uh, what's there and leave the rest for nature basically. So just take a little bit from each,、um, each bush and keep moving kind of thing. Leave.、Um, Don't, definitely don't take all of, the, all of it, or even like 50% is pushing it.、Um, but yeah, basically, with elders as well,、uh, if you pick the flowers for, say, making、uh, champagne or cordial,、um, if you pick all of them, there won't be any berries. So it's like that with a lot of the fruits. Like if you pick the all the flowers, then there won't be any berries and there won't be any. So that sort of takes、uh, the food from the bees. And,、uh, and it takes the food away from、um, the birds as well, because obviously there won't be any、uh, fruit. And, and, and any of the fruit that would fall for like anim- small mammals.、Um, so, yeah. And、um, yeah, so definitely、um, be conscious of what you're taking and, and definitely share with wildlife. Yeah. That's a really good explanation. Thank you, and, and really thoughtful.、Um, I think it's often people don't think about the, the other little creatures that are running around and, and survive off these things normally. So、um, that's brilliant. Thank you. Does anybody want to add anything to that for Robert's question? Or should we move on to the next one?、Uh, just very quickly, that if, you know, if we take half, which is the suggestion in the question, and then somebody else comes along and takes half of what's left, and then somebody else, it can rapidly、that's、diminish. So 10% is. You know, if somebody takes 10 and then another person takes 10, it's, it's still not too bad, is it? It's, not, it's still leaving plenty. So 10% is a nice number, I think. Yeah, that's, that's a really、idea. good point. Yeah. Well, so, okay. So, question six Can I use wood ashes in my garden? I burn,、um, I burn leaves, pine needles, wood, etc., every year, and I have a huge pile of ashes. Can these ashes be used in my vegetable garden? This is From、um, Frida in Spain, and she said thanks for the show. Thank you, Frida. So I、Anybody、can answer that、one? one. Okay, Peter, thank you. So, for a long time here, Sweden was recommended actually to use uh, wood ashes, uh, you know, in private courts, and, and, and was always recommended in Q's and A's on radio programs and so forth. But then actually, Uh, they uh, through Swedish radio they sampled over 150 samples all over Sweden and sent it to the laboratory. And then they actually found out it was a lot of cadmium in the samples. So now in Sweden, this is 
it's not actually recommended anymore to put it on annuals or biannuals or you know or uh, and be very careful about the amount you spread so uh, it's it's it depends where you lived in sweden but it was still at 10 times higher rate than uh, chemical fertilizers of cadmium in, in, in some of the samples of the wood ashes. So I don't know how it's in UK, but this came out about two years ago in Sweden. So I, I, so we, we fire, we um, make the heat in our house with uh, just with wood. So for us, it's a tactic spreading it around and not uh, using it too close to our annuals anyway. So. But it's not. It would be nice to hear how 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 you thinking about this in the UK, or in Spain, where the question is from. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean essentially that that idea of concentrating into from the soil into the trees, and then you're burning a lot of trees, and you end up with this what looks quite small, but actually it's a lot of trees, <laughs> uh, or a lot of logs. So, oh, for me, the thing is just to be aware of what's going in. So and obviously it's hard to tell if you've got a, a pile of logs and you don't know that the tree has accumulated all this cadmium that's been in the soil, presumably. But certainly I, you know, if somebody's burning pallets or anything like that, then I would be really cautious. Or, you know, wood that's been treated, be really cautious about what you do with that rather than putting it onto the soil. Because when you're eating that food, then it can get through that chain and it can accumulate in the body. So um, but I think if things are, if you're confident that things are fresh and clean and they're going to be okay, then maybe. This, they do, wood ashes will alkalize things a little bit. So some things really don't like them, like blueberries and so on. But you can use small amounts on things like raspberries that like it a little bit more acidic. Um, small amounts, but fruit, you know, potassium, but the potash is very good for fruits and flowers and things. So in moderation. And also, it's um, that within um, potash, uh, within the wood ash, is water soluble. So once it gets wet, it washes it through. So you got to keep it dry and apply it, and then so don't let it get wet. Otherwise, it's just going to wash out anyway. Yeah, really useful stuff there. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, that was really good. Um, wow. Um, oh, Graham, you've got some. Um, there we go, Graham. What can you add? Um, just a little bit, slide. Um I remember reading um, Lawrence B. Hills in his book about gardening. Um, Lawrence B. Hills, who um, founded the Henry Doubleday Research Association, put now Garden Organic, a um, bit of a pioneer back then. I remember reading one of his books. He was argued that you should refrain from adding too much record soil because all the things that Rania talked about there and had that tendency to alkalize as well. Um, but he suggested that really probably the best thing would actually actually to compost it, actually add it to compost, and then it kind of goes nutrients and kind of brown and be more made available with more um, dilute um, form, if you like, a little bit of a piece of uranium or something. That's a good idea. So we could possibly put it in the compost. Um, that's a good idea because we, we're trying to waste as little as possible. So it's, it's good to know where it can go. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot for that. Um, it's been really interesting today. I, I've learned absolutely loads and um, I'm going to be tuning in more often from now on. I think, have we got time for another question or have we, um, where are we at now? I think it's, um, I think it's, oh, that's right. I've just been giving the guide. We've got time for another question. Fantastic. Um, so the next question is, here we go. Does anyone know where I can get some vegan properly corn gardening gloves? Oh my goodness. This is a really good question because I've, um, I've been tackling something recently and um, somebody told me to get suede new book garden gloves, but obviously I don't want to do that. So um, what advice can you give um, what, what have you found works that doesn't involve using animal products? Have we got someone that can answer that? I can. The question's still up on the screen. <laughs> no, I'm just waiting for them. There we go. It's got <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, there you go. Really? We actually found visual too. 
yeah snowboarding really really difficult to get i ended up sending off for these from america through ebay absolutely ridiculous i couldn't believe that it would be so hard to get some synthetic vegan gardening gloves and it ended up costing me about 30 quid or something uh, by the time you paid the customs tax and the postage and everything else but they really i mean they're good solid gloves they just you know apart from the fact that we know that they're not uh, leather and they got so this is pro rose yeah, that's really helpful does it say uh, hero master i can't see that properly at the top what's the name uh, of the company hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get it to focus it's not going to is it mm -hmm. and master uh it does say hand master there we Bring go um, you get that from mm -hmm. ebay you say so it says uh i don't know if you can see on the back there that's not really come on focus so it's all synthetic materials yeah maybe i oh, need to drop that down in front of me oh there we are just, oh, okay. nine on 40 percent polyurethane 96 mm -hmm. polyester four percent spandex if you don't like spandex then <laughs> so it was made in pakistan and sent to america and then sent back to you i know absolutely bonkers and then subsequently i did come across um, a website called garden divas spelled d-i-v-a-s um, and they've got some fox i think it's called fox loves gauntlets uh, and it does say they're vegan so i haven't tried those because the challenge with these is you've got to guess your your hand size as well so my hands are fairly big and these were large so men's large and they're okay um just about but yeah they're great we've been using them for brambles and because i got a, a rose thorn in my knuckle a few weeks ago and it went it was quite nasty um yeah. so i realized i needed to get some of these so yeah i would recommend these definitely yeah nature's own defense that's brilliant. So it is possible to get them. And I'm sure that as um, as demand increases, I'm hoping that there'll be more places to get these from. Um, yeah. So that's great. Thank you. Do we have time for another question? Or is that, um, is, is that... <laughs> I'm waiting for the cue from Dan. He's the man behind the screen giving us, telling us what to do here. He's the, the one in control here. Um, I, I will would be great if some oh, kind of... Yeah. <laughs> there we go with that time. I thought you said after okay. forty. I'm happy to. I'm happy to stay for for ages. I'm um, I'm yeah. having a good time here. So, anyway, um, question nine. I've recently gotten into foraging for mushrooms locally, and have been happily eating field mushrooms and giant footballs. These are absolutely delicious if you can find them. By the way, I was reading a foraging book the other day, and it stated that there is only one true, truly deadly poisonous mushroom in the UK, and that's the death cap. All the others may well make you really ill, but would be unlikely to kill you unless you eat them in large quantities. Is this true? And this comes in from Dave. Thank you, Dave. That's a really good question because this goes back to what I mentioned earlier, especially mushrooms. We're told don't touch the mushrooms. They're going to make you ill. You're going to get sick. You're going to die. Don't touch them. So if you can give us any advice, that would be really great. Okay. You, I you think I, I'd like to start on that one. Um, with all foraging and all wild food, um, I'd say you need to be 110% sure on what it is that you're looking at and that it is edible, because the last thing you want to be doing is poisoning yourself, even if it is slightly. So that goes from fruits, leaves, uh, mushrooms, uh, even seaweeds. Um, but what I'd coming back to the mushroom question, I'd say there's a really good book, um, Roger Phillips' Mushrooms. And it's a bit of an encyclopedia. Uh, it's about between 10 and 20 quid on eBay or Amazon. Or you could probably find it in your local bookstore um, if they haven't got it. Or even li the li a lot of the libraries have got it as well. And it goes into loads and loads of details right across the board. Um, it's absolutely incredible. And the thing is with mushrooms is that from what I've been taught, uh, there is, for every edible mushroom, there's a look-alike uh, poisonous. So basically, you don't want to be po you don't want to be poisoning yourself or getting it confused. I, I mean, I'm still learning. I'm sure we all are. Um, but yeah, coming back to the question on is there one deadly um, mushroom in the UK? I've got a um, there's a, there's a section here in the introduction where it goes. Um, potentially deadly poisonous species. Okay, it does start 
of the death cap then you've got uh the destroying angel the panther cap fiber caps uh red staining fiber cap web caps deadly web cap fool's web cap there's loads so it's a case of really do your homework and don't just assume that it's just, there's just one um, I've been poisoned by um, mushrooms before, and it's not very pleasant, even if they're just slightly um, poisonous or to some people. Um, and mine was um, shaggy paracels, which are generally considered okay, but something was slightly wrong there, slightly dodgy. And well, it wasn't, <laughs> it was a learning curve, let's put it that way. But yeah, nobody really wants to poison themselves in any way, especially. Um, just assuming that one species might be deadly. I think you need to be 110% sure. So yeah, mm -hmm. I can't, I can't sort of um, emphasize that more really. Good advice there. So it's better just to be safe. Yeah, absolutely. Unless you absolutely know what you're doing. Thank you for that. Um, anything to add or should we move on to our next question? Okay, next question. Just but yeah, you've only yeah. got to eat one deadly mushroom and that's it. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> There's no coming back from or, that really, is or, there? Or a deadly uh, berry or It sounds like John's had experience of one that was just <laughs> making him ill enough to not even just to even go that with him for a while. Yeah, that's pretty true, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, right, so we've had the... Graham's got his hand up. Here we go. What's the best way to harvest kale? Hale is a bit of a buzzword in the vegan community at the moment, isn't it? It's um, <laughs> hail, yeah, and all that. <laughs> what's the best way to harvest it? I mean, it's quite an interesting is, is question. There, is there a bad way to harvest it? <laughs> <laughs> I like it, yeah. I mean, from my from my experience, it, it, it comes down to, I think, the scale that someone might be harvesting on. Uh, some it, I have seen it harvested where, obviously, grown on a large scale, they just literally cut the cut the top off and sell the whole thing, um, the whole plant basically. So then it's up to one when they get it home to uh, to take the leaves off. And for me, when I grow it, uh, I don't obviously grow it in massive scale at the moment. Um, but what I do. Um, is the the leaves at the bottom and uh, when they start to get a bit old i drop those for the slugs and snails and they love that so that's a real good um sort of way that you don't have to spray any chemicals on the kale uh, and then just basically take the nicest leaves off uh, for home use uh, and and they just keep growing so you don't need to pull them up out the ground just take what you take what you need and uh, they 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 last for absolutely ages, and when you see them, when they finally go to seed, um, you can you can save those seeds for the next year of planting. Really, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And again, thinking about the the critters who are nearby, instead of we don't need to use all those pesticides and poisons, do we? Just bear them in no. mind. We're um, harvesting. Thank you. Is anything else to add, anybody, or um, are we good there? Okay, well, thank you so much. That does bring us to the end of the show. For anybody watching, please will you give us a like and a sub subscribe because there's a lot more coming. And if you've got any questions, send some questions in and we'll get on to those in the next show. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure being here. And um, thank you to all our panel members for being here today. And thank you for spending time with us and answering all the questions. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Absolutely awesome. Many thanks to our panel and to you for watching. Please support and join us on our veganic mission to be part of a worldwide movement for a peaceful, just world where agriculture is earth, animal and human friendly.